So today I'd like to continue where I left off uh, last, last, uh, last week, yes, last week. And we're talking about the, I was talking about the Noble Eightfold Path and uh, uh, we had the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path last week, which was Samaditi, right view. And uh, as I mentioned then, Samaditi is very important for how we practice the whole path. If our view isn't right in the sense sense of being right, because people always ask, how can you say it's right? <laughs> what do you mean it's right? Does that mean everybody else is wrong? And that's what people think, don't they, actually? They think like that. I did too when I first encountered it. I thought, well, how can you say that? <laughs> but of course, what the Buddha is talking about is right for attaining awakening, right for becoming enlightened. enlightened. There are many views that are perfectly okay, but they won't take you there. They won't take you to enlightenment. And what the Buddha was interested in is in enlightenment. He's, he was interested in happiness here and now, happiness of future lives, and of course the ultimate happiness and Nibbāna. So this is the point of uh, why they write. And um, one of the things, I was going to quote a, a verse from the Dhammapada, the Buddha made uh, these uh, poetic uh, utterances, as you call them, or sayings. And uh, he had a whole a series of them about the Noble Eightfold Path. And this one is a very nice one which says, Walking upon this path, you will make an end of suffering. Having discovered how to pull out the thorn of lust, I make known the path. So that's a very, very nice uh, uh, comment what the Buddha is making about the Noble Eightfold Path. That it is to the end, that takes us to the end of suffering. This is the end of um, all unsatisfactoriness. This is the end of being born again and again. But he's talking also, as I mentioned before, about the happiness that we can develop along the way. We need happiness in this path. And this is a very important part of the path. And Samaditi, the right view I was talking about, is like, a, of like it's been likened to a map. You know, it's a map of the territory we, we need to go through in terms of insight and developing wisdom. And that territory, of course, is primarily, of course, kamma, rebirth. Uh, kamma, that's the, uh, the notion that our ethical uh, actions of body, speech and mind have a like uh, resultant. So if it's a negative uh, act of body, speech or mind, we'll have a negative result, a positive We'll have a positive result. So very important. And rebirth, the idea that this is not the only life, is very important in the Buddha's teaching and was very was crucial to his experience of enlightenment, actually. It's what he saw himself, actually. So very, very important. And uh, not only those, um, uh, and also the enlightenment of... Uh, the enlight there are enlightened teachers, spiritual teachers, that can show us the way. That's an important part of right view. Because if we don't think that, then why would we listen to the teachings of the Buddha? <laughs> why would we listen to anybody? We have to have some faith that they are further along the path than we are. And hopefully, you know, we see the results in their practice, in the way they behave, the way they speak. And of course, this is the Buddha. He said, you know, check up on myself, check up on myself, he said, by the way I speak, by the way I act. And ultimately, if you put into practice what I teach, you'll see the results for yourself you know, that hopefully you will attain enlightenment. So this is, uh, the Buddha was very much open to that, uh, being investigated. So people shouldn't be afraid of that. But today is the, and this is the, I've been likening, talking about the Noble Eightfold Path in terms of the wheel of Dhamma. And it's got eight spokes. So today is spoke number two. Spoke number one, uh, right view, samaditi. And today, spoke number two, right motivation. I, I'm calling it today right motivation, right intention. Sometimes it's called right thought. In Pali, it's called sama sankapa. And this, this with right view is actually, you know, to me, the most two crucial factors in the path. They're all crucial, really. <laughs> They're all crucial. But like right view shows you, uh, as I say, the territory, the map of what we have to investigate, what we have to understand, what we, areas that are good to look in to develop wisdom. And so that's essential because otherwise, like uh, anybody, if we don't have a map, it's a good chance we'll get lost, a good chance we won't arrive at the destination we intend. If you don't know your way to uh, Sydney from here, well, and you don't have a map, <laughs> it's quite likely you won't arrive actually. <laughs> But we're lucky, the Buddha gave us this map. 
But the um, right intention or right motivation, as I'm calling it, uh, John Brahm calls it right motivation, I think it's a very good, good uh, term for it, is how we practice the path. And it's very, very important because, you know, the right view, that's theory, isn't it? That's theory until we've recon realized it for ourselves. Of course, the, the Buddha is not, uh, he's saying to all of us, don't, don't uh, be satisfied with just knowing the theory. Don't be satisfied with knowledge. We have to make it our own experience. We have to understand it for ourselves. Otherwise, it's the Buddha's knowledge. It was the Buddha's knowledge, not ours. And even though I, I would argue that it, having an intellectual understanding of the Buddha's teaching is still very helpful, actually, for reducing our suffering, for making sense of the world we live in. Because sometimes very chaotic, and people people think, well, how does this all fit in? You know, when you read the Buddha's teaching, you think, oh yeah, yeah, I can understand. You know, otherwise it can be very bewildering. So as I say, the um, right intention or right motivation is the way we direct the mind. The actually, it's the the what I would say the feeling side of the path, and it's also at the same time, it's um, it gives you an indication of how your practice is going. Because right motivation, it hinges on three qualities, which I'll go into in more detail. First one they call renunciation. The second one we call uh, non-ill will. The third one, non-cruelty or non-harming. And these, these uh, terms maybe don't have a lot of meaning to people because they're sort of very general terms. But in a way, they indicate the way we should practice the path because Renunciation points out to us that this path the Buddha is teaching about, teaching us about, is not about getting and gaining. This is what we do in daily life, in everyday life. We think about gaining and getting, don't we? And this path is about letting go, letting go of um, our desires, our attachments, all the things that we think are going to bring us happiness, but which don't actually deliver the goods. So renunciation is a, a very important, uh, important uh, emotional quality. It's letting go. It comes from wisdom, actually. It comes from wisdom, and I'll talk more about that. And the second one, non-ill will. Usually um, people say the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is metta, or loving-kindness, maitri in, in uh, Sanskrit. And that's part of it but it encompasses all things that are non-ill will. So it could include gratitude, you know, katanyuta. It could include contentment. It can include giving. It could include many things, actually, as well. And like mudita, this is joy with others, compassion and equanimity. These are all non-ill will. But the main one we focus on, of course, is uh, metta or maitri and non-harming non-harming or non-cruelty. Cruelty always sounds a bit strong to me. <laughs> but uh, non-harming ourselves or others is very important. And of course, that's more positively expressed in compassion. But it can be expressed in many different ways. You know, Perhaps you could say service and things like this. Anything that uh, goes in the opposite direction of helping, helping oneself, helping others in a very positive sense. So these are all, uh, I would say, very much wholesome emotions, you know, coming from wisdom. They all need wisdom, actually, to make them work. But they are wholesome emotions. So in a very real sense, you know, we can see our practice on the path, whether it's developing. People always say, how do I know if I'm, practicing, uh, I'm developing? You know, and they, they may think in terms of, well, I haven't got first jhana yet, but, you know, I've got this and I've got that. And we think of attainments. This is not renunciation, of course, is it? And trying to uh, it were, uh, get brownie points, we call it brownie point scoring. So how do we know? We know if we are our, uh, uh, the desires we have in the mind, the attachments we have in the mind are, are reducing. And when I say that, you know, some people have the idea that they've got to go out there and say, oh, I'm not going to have any attachments and no desires. It doesn't work like that. It's only those desires and attachments go when we understand them for what they are, to understand that they don't lead to happiness, our happiness, or anybody else's for that matter. And see that once we see that, letting go naturally happens. And of course, non-ill will, or we say uh, metta, or any of these positive qualities, is a good indicator uh, also if we have let go of a lot of anger, irritation in daily life. We can see it. 
So the first one, if we've let go of a lot of our attachments and desires, we find that we're easier going, we're easier going, and we're not so caught up with the sense of, I have to get this because this is for my happiness, this is real happiness. It isn't real happiness, of course. So, <laughs> so this is a very important thermometer, as is a uh, non-ill will, the fact that we are not negative, we're less negative, we deal with situations, difficult situations, difficult people, better. And we can deal with those difficult situations in ourselves better, because often we we can be very harsh on ourselves as well. So this is a very good thermometer as well. And non-harming, that wish not to harm ourselves or others. If we see that reducing, you know, that we don't lash out with, uh, give people a mouthful, as people say, <laughs> with uh, if they've said something to us that's upset us, we don't react immediately with uh, something, give, give us, uh, good as we've got, you know, we've been given. We don't react with the same necessarily straight away. So we can see these qualities developing and when we do, it gives us some confidence that the path is working for us. And I think this is very important. Then it, then it gives more faith for practice. We, we give more time to, to developing uh, all the aspects of the path. So the important thing, what is right motivation then? And uh, the Buddha said uh, in the Diginikaya, actions of body, speech and mind coming from, uh, this is, coming from a motive of renunciation, from a motive of kindness and coming from a motive of gentleness. This is called right motivation. And this is, this gives you a very good idea of what I'm talking about. This is what we're trying to develop, the sense of letting go, the sense of loving kindness or any of the other positive emotions and a sense of gentleness helpfulness, harmlessness is a very nice word, isn't it? Harmlessness is good. So these are, these are in, this is the definition that the Buddha gave actually. And he, he said that in order to develop these, we need to develop perceptions that support those. So perceptions of letting go and perceptions of kindness and gentleness. And so this is, this is very important for, this is how we develop it. So for instance, you know, with letting go, of course, it comes from wisdom, understanding that what these things, these sen pleasures through the senses of hearing, smelling, tasting and touching are not real happiness. They're not the real, uh, the real thing. I think everybody remembers that. Uh, I don't know if they use it still. Coca-Cola used to use that, that logo or that slogan, the real thing, the real thing. I always laughed when I said that. I thought, wow. But people think that is the real thing, you know, through seeing, hearing, and smelling, and tasting, and touching, and so on. They think that is the real thing. But everybody knows, actually, to a large extent, that that's not the real thing. Yeah, the happiness, that's for sure. But they're not satisfying happiness. And as I was saying last night, it's like fairy floss happiness. It's very sweet and sugary, but it's, uh, it's not sustaining. It's not food. It's not real nourishment. And this is what uh, we're looking for, real nourishment uh, in, uh, from, from our experience. It's not the real thing. So this is an uh, important part of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. You know, these, these and the same with uh, um, loving kindness. It's supported by the wisdom, the understanding that we and everyone is looking for happiness, is looking for freedom from suffering, looking for peace within themselves. That's a very important uh, understanding that goes with loving kindness. Sometimes people think loving kindness is just an emotion that you arouse, but actually it is, it is, it is an emotion and that's very important. The feeling is what we're aiming at, but it's supported by understanding. And the better your understanding is, the deeper that's, um, that loving kindness, that metta, that maitri will be. And it's the same with uh, also uh, non-harming with uh, uh, um, harmlessness. That's supported by the understanding that all beings don't wish to experience uh, suffering, don't wish to experience difficulties in their lives. We don't. <laughs> so what to say of others? <laughs> so very important. And as I mentioned too, these uh, with right view, I mentioned it's a very true with Samasankapa too, with the right motivation. Each factor of the path must to be a path that leads to enlightenment, to be a path to full awakening, has to be supported by right view, 
There has to be a view that's in accord with reality, as I, I said last week. It has to be, uh, that view has to inform every step of the path. So it has to be part of right intention, it has to be part of right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right samadhi. If it doesn't, if there's no right view there, it's not, it won't be right samadhi, it won't be right mindfulness and so on. And just in the same way, very importantly, if it's not coming from the right motivation, each of those path factors won't be right. So for instance, we can see meditators, you know, who are practicing in a very, you know, uh, I've seen it myself, very willful, strong sense of ego, I'm going to get this, and, and, and they're pushing through, they're forcing the mind, forcing the body. Uh, with young monks, it's very common, young meditators, you know, they'll ruin their knees <laughs> trying to sit full lotus, but they do the same with their mind, you know, we can do the same with the mind. So this is very important that we actually develop all the path factors with the sense of letting go, with the sense of, we say, uh, metta or loving kindness, and the sense of not harming, not harming ourselves or harming every, anyone else. And then the path is working. Then those path factors will work properly. So this is a very, very important part of the path. And the right view is very important for developing um, right motivation because if you, if you understand the law of karma, that there are uh, consequences of how we behave, speak and act, then that will also mean that our motivation is affected by that. We will start to uh, let go of the negative reactions that we can have to situations and we'll start to develop positive ones like loving kindness and also non-harming. So the sense of, uh, the, uh, of karma, understanding karma, is very important there too. And of course the right view of the Four Noble Truths, particularly that desire, craving, is a source of the problem, is a source of all our suffering, unsatisfactoriness. And that in, that in itself will lead to a very natural if it goes deeply, very natural understanding, let go. <laughs> let go of all these cravings. They seem so important at the time. We, what we want seems to be essential at the time. And, uh, but with this understanding, we can let go and see the results. See if it's better with or better without. This is one of my tests <laughs> for, for life, actually. You try things and you say, this, that. I say to myself, oh, is it better with this or better without? And you can see the comparison then, and this is the way we can practice actually. Uh, it's a good, uh, good sort of a way to practice. And when the Buddha uh, was, was uh, before he became enlightened, he was still a bodhisattva, he actually discovered uh, this uh, right motivation, samasankapa. We tend to think that the, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path sort of arose immediately after the Buddha's enlightenment, don't we? As a, as a factor of the, the Four Noble Truths, the fourth factor. Four Noble Truths, you know, there, there is suffering unsatis or unsatisfactoriness, there is a cause for it, there is a cessation of it, and there's a way to the cessation of unsatisfactoriness or suffering. And this last one is the Noble Eightfold Path, of course. But if you read in the suttas, and this is in the, uh, the middle length discourses, the Buddha talks about how he discovered um, uh, right motivation and he was still before he had actually um, become a Buddha he was probably practicing for six years he had practiced in the forest very hard practice very forceful practice uh, you could say you know perhaps harmful practice in a way not being kind not being uh, gentle with himself and uh, but he came on the understanding that there were two kinds of uh, uh, thought or two kinds of motivations. And of course that is, uh, that as I was saying, there's the negative side which is the, uh, the, the sense, sense desires, sensory pleasures that we, we focus on looking for our happiness. There's also uh, viapada, anger, and negativity. And also there is vihinsa, cruelty, and the opposite. He realized his thoughts could be taken up with those negative ones or with the positive ones. And the positive ones, as I say, renunciation, 
renunciation, letting go, letting go. And we can say loving kindness and compassion or not harming. And he said, this is a very important thing. It sounds like a small thing, but it's a very important quote from the Buddha, actually. He said, monks, whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind or her mind. If, if, it's a nun, if he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of sensual desire, he has abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. And then his mind inclines to the thoughts to thoughts of sensual desire. And likewise, if he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of ill will, his mind has abandoned thoughts of non-ill will to develop that ill will, cultivate that ill will. And similarly, uh, if he um, develops thoughts uh, based upon thoughts of cruelty, he has abandoned the thought of non-cruelty, this is like compassion, to cultivate the thought of cruelty, and then his mind inclines to thoughts of cruelty. So this is a very important fact, actually. First of all, that we can cultivate these motivations. Often people think they're just natural givens. You know, we can't do much about it. I'm an angry person. You know, if it gets really bad, then somebody will go to a psychologist and <laughs> try to reduce the anger or the rage or whatever. But often we just think these negative qualities, as well as the positive qualities, you know, like uh, loving kindness, compassion, Often in the West, particularly, we think we either have it or you don't. It's my nature. The idea of developing or cultivating is incredible. You know, the Buddha actually pointed to the fact we can work with our minds. We can develop our wholesome qualities. Or here, he's actually saying you can cultivate, develop your negative qualities. And we can see that in the world. Some people have done very well in de developing their negative qualities to an incredible degree. <laughs> such that their hatred and rage can be truly uh, terrifying, actually, and awful. And, uh, of course, for them, what sort of happiness can that give them? Maybe a sense of power that they can intimidate, but not much happiness. There's not much out one can get from that. So the Buddha is actually telling us that we can incline our minds towards the positive or to the negative. It's up to us. And when we do go towards the positive, developing the positive, then the negative is reduced. When we do the converse, of course, when we put a lot of emphasis on the negative, getting, gaining, that's pretty big, <laughs> and uh, also anger, ill will, blaming other people for our suffering, and also cruelty, acting on that, in a sense, acting on that ill will, that negativity. If we do, we can develop that. The Buddha is saying we can develop that. But everybody knows that those qualities, if developed and uh, perfected, they won't lead to happiness for oneself and a lot of suffering for everybody else as well. But the important thing about the Buddha's understanding here was that he saw a way of uh, abandoning the negative aspects of mind. That's very useful for us. He said the first thing that helps us abandon, helped him abandon it, was to see that, just to recognize that, know that this negative quality, you know, this sort of... Uh, since uh, this uh, greed had arisen in the mind, or this anger had arisen in the mind, or this cruelty had arisen in the mind. If we recognize it, it's a big difference from just being caught up in it and just being totally angry, totally, say, cruel, or totally greedy. If we're recognizing something, if we know it, we're one step back. And this, is, this was enough for him sometimes to abandon that negative thought of uh, getting, gaining, or anger or cruelty. But then he said, the next thing that helped him was to realize, and this helps us too, these negative things, do they help me? And he said, no, they do not help. They lead to harm for myself. And then these negative thoughts could were sometimes abandoned. Or the next thing he thought was, does it lead to harm for others? And then sometimes that would lead to letting go of these negative thoughts. And his last strategy was, and it uh, seems like all these work for him, <laughs> was that uh, these negative thoughts, be it greed, anger, or cruelty, or you know, harming, I like better, they obstruct wisdom. In other words, you cannot see things clearly when you have these negative mind states. They obstruct wisdom, they cause difficulties, and they lead away from Nibbana. So he, that was enough for him to let go. It's interesting that he says they lead away from Nibbana because he wasn't enlightened. So, 
So how did he know that uh, what what uh, nibbana was? But I think it was a general understanding at that time that this was enlightenment. Sometimes they call it moksha, freedom, liberation, and he had that general idea. This is not leading in that direction, because uh, anger, uh, getting, ang you know, a lot of greed, anger, and cruelty do not lead to liberation. They cause more bonds, more tr troubles and problems for us. So, and he also realized that he could, um, as I was mentioned too, that uh, the other way he could reflect on the, the wholesome side of things, the positive emotions, and they would just get stronger and stronger because he gave more time to them. But he realized that if he thought about them a lot, if he focused on these motivations a lot, it would keep the mind very busy uh, and would tire the body. And he said when the body is tired, it's very difficult for the mind to come together, to be one-pointed, to be still steady, and ready to really see things as they are, you know, looking deeply. So he 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 um, uh, he said actually that uh, it disturbs the mind and it can't quieten the mind internally and bring it to stillness and oneness. Because that's important for seeing things as they truly are, developing wisdom. So I'll just briefly talk about each of these uh, factors: renunciation, um, uh, non-ill will, or <laughs> Non ill will is too general, isn't it? You have to say something like loving kindness and also um, non cruelty or non harming, which we can call like a compassion or helpfulness. Harmlessness is good. So, as I mentioned, uh, renunciation is giving up and letting go, and that's a very important direction of the path. And if we find that we are trying to get, trying to gain, trying to compete, trying to compare with others, our spiritual uh, attainments, our understanding on the path, this is obviously not the right direction to go in because we're trying to, this is, we're using our everyday uh, mind, which is in, it very much caught up with getting and gaining, isn't it? That's, that's very much the uh, conditioning we have is we get and gain and then we'll be happy. I think most people have done that <laughs> quite a lot and they can see, yes, there is some happiness from retail therapy, as they call it, <laughs> but, but but it's not very satisfying. It doesn't last long either, actually, before you move on to something else that's going to make me happy. And this is uh, this is part of the understanding that's very important uh, for uh, uh, developing letting go, because if we see the shortcomings of desire, if we see the shortcomings of the sens uh, sensory pleasures. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching, nothing wrong with those things, nothing wrong with them. But if we expect all our happiness to come from them, then there's big problems because we won't be satisfied. We can, we've all met people, we've all seen it in ourselves, that sense of emptiness and boredom that can come when we can really indulge the five senses, whether it be eating, smelling, tasting or touching. We, when we do that, we find that this is not satisfying. It doesn't lead to real happiness. There is happiness there, that, that's undeniable. But it's a very short-term uh, sort of happiness and it's not a deep happiness, a satisfying happiness, as I said before. It's like fairy floss. And the thing with those, uh, um, those sorts of happiness, it's quite expensive <laughs> and time-consuming to, to develop them, having to uh, always trying to repeat them and increase the uh, intensity and pleasure from them. And you, we can all notice, you know, we often talk about addiction these days and there's lots of addictions to this and that. Basically addictions to the five sense pleasures, you know, that we're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. Because why is, why, what's the essence of addiction is we want this pleasant feeling and certainly there is a pleasant feeling there. But we get so attached to this thing is going to give me the pleasant feeling that it becomes a major ad addiction, can become an addiction. And for many people, addiction is not you know, necessarily to drugs uh, or alcohol, like uh, alcoholism and so on. But there can be many other very subtle addictions to particular types of food, tea, coffee. Coffee is pretty big. <laughs> I, see, I see people in the morning, I go for the arms round, sometimes to the shopping centre, and people are always getting coffees in the morning, big trays of them. So... No, we have, we have, uh, we would sense pleasures naturally of themselves because that search for pleasant feeling leads us to addiction. It leads to addiction. It leads to enslavement of the mind. 
that we have to have these things. Without them, we won't be happy. And this is the, the, one of the shortcomings, as it were, of, uh, of desire, sense desires in general. And of course, they're endless. That's another fact that uh, you, we all notice. You've got what you really, your heart desires, if you say the heart desires. But then the mind's on to the next thing <laughs> very, very quickly. And it's almost like the thing that was so important previously before you had it, now is it's not that important. And of course, what uh, we all see, isn't it, with sense desires and uh, desire in general, it's built on the principle of lack. We feel like we have to, we're lacking this. And what are we lacking? It's we're lacking in happiness. We want to get happiness from this thing. And as I say, through the feeling, it's the feeling that arises in us. Often, you know, what happens really, the whole world is experienced like the feeling is uh, within us, but we somehow, we, we look to the externals and think they are responsible for the feelings that we experience. They're only triggers, they're only triggers. So it's not, it's those feelings are within us and can be developed in other ways. And of course, all those things that we, we uh, have great desires for, we, we see them break down, they, they uh, don't last very long, some of them very short term. I think, uh, I think most people who have children, the, the parents uh, often see, don't they? I see even in Sri Lanka when I go on the arms round, all these toys very quickly broken down. <laughs> You know, the batteries are run out or it doesn't work. They're, you know, kids are pretty tough on toys. So uh, it, the impermanence of things is very obvious, obvious that they don't last. And so this is another reason for not uh, attaching to them. And of course, a uh, very nice saying about attachment, if we're very attached, we're going to suffer a lot. If we're attached a little, we'll suffer a little. If we have no attachments, then we won't suffer at all. And this is, of course, the message of the Buddha. But it's not only, it's not only, of course, you know, the five senses, that they're a major preoccupation for us, aren't they? Are. But, but uh, there are many other things that we're attached to. And the biggies are, of course, the body, the mind. We've got great attachments to those. And uh, the, these can cause a great deal of suffering. In fact, one of the major sufferings for people, particularly when you're young, if I see it, saw it in myself too, is you want to look different from what you look like. <laughs> People always want to look, you know, they've got dark hair, they want blonde hair, they've got straight hair, they want curly hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It goes on and on. You know, and it's a great source of suffering for people because we think it's our body. We don't we don't recognize that the body is part of nature. We have some control over how it looks and uh, how it functions by the way we eat and the way we look after it. But in the ultimate sense, we cannot control it uh, in, in a, a very deep way at all. And in fact, as I say, if I had been responsible for looking after this body, the running of this body, I would have forgotten to breathe years ago or the heart would have stopped beating. So it's, a, it's an exercise in seeing that the body and the mind are both rising from causes and conditions. It's not from me and mine. This is a, this is a big suffering for us, isn't it? Me and mine. Once something is me and mine, then there's a lot of suffering can be expected. So, and the other areas that are very important, just to mention briefly, and people will recognize these immediately, actually, it, apart from this view of self, me and mine, whatever we take to be me and mine, will cause suffering, you know. If we take, for instance, our children to be ours, then that can give rise to a lot. I think most parents find that. <laughs> if they have that sense of owning their children, they're certainly responsible for them, but if we own them, then we want them to be in a certain way and not, in a, uh, not act and behave in a, another way. And to do that is, uh, is in, not in accord with reality. Me and mine is not in accord with reality. Uh, reality won't comply to what we want, how we like it, but it can teach us. <laughs> Every moment can teach us that, that uh, uh, we haven't got that control over things, not that much control. But the other big area, and it's very important to you see it every day, is the attachment to our views and opinions. That's pretty big, actually. And this is often very much connected with that sense of me and mine, they're my views, <laughs> and therefore very important and, and probably very true. And other people's views are probably wrong and, uh, and uh, not true. We see this very much in politics and you see it in the news all the time, people with all these views and opinions 
uh, that they cause a lot of suffering for themselves, but maybe also for others as well. Uh, but we certainly take them to be me and mine. And one of the, uh, just as a, as a nice story too, that the emphasizes uh, the essence, the, uh, the wisdom for renunciation was the uh, story of the time of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha was visited by a man whose son had died. And he, was only, he was the only son and he was absolutely traumatized and he was going to the cemetery and crying and he couldn't eat, he couldn't work and going to the cemetery and saying, where have you gone, where have you gone and all this sort of thing. And he came and saw the Buddha and uh, at the, I think at the Jetawanda in, in uh, Savati and he came and saw him and he told him what his uh, situation was. And the Buddha, the Buddha commented straight away, very interesting, it's very direct actually. He said, you know, your faculties look deranged. Well, you know, it was a nice way of saying, you look a bit crazy. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> he was a bit crazy at that time. And uh, he said yes, and he told him, told the Buddha what had happened. And the Buddha said, oh, he said, uh, from those that are dear and, uh, dear and close to us, that's where suffering arises. That's where unhappiness arises. And this man was absolutely, um, he was absolutely aghast. He said, no, no, that's not, that's not correct. He told the Buddha. He said, no, no, from those who are dear and delightful, whether they be people or things, uh, you know, the happiness comes. And he even went off to, I thought this is a nice comment they put in the, a nice editorial piece they put in the Sutta too. He goes off to some gamblers who weren't too far away. They're throwing dice in those days. That seemed to be the casino of the day, was throwing dice. And he, sa he told them what the Buddha said. And they said, oh, you're right, you're right, of course. Dear ones and delightful, you know, the things that are dear and delightful to us, that's that form of happiness. And then uh, uh, the king, Persenity, heard about this. And he was a, he, at that time, he wasn't such a supporter of the Buddha. But his wife, the Queen Malika, heard, uh, she was, she was a great supporter. And the king told, told her, obviously sort of scoffing, saying, look what the Buddha said now. <laughs> you know, can you believe this? And she said, she said to him, well, you know, if he said it, if the Buddha said it, it must be true. And he, he really poo-pooed that. He said, you always say <laughs> whatever the Buddha says is true, you know, is right. Because she said, you know, to target it doesn't lie. And that's true, you know. So uh, he, he was very, uh, you know, he... he um, uh, was very disappointed with her and dismissed her and said, wow, what would you know, sort of thing. And then she sent uh, a messenger to the Buddha to ask him to explain, you know, what he had intended by that. And uh, the Brahmin went and he asked. And he said to the, to the Brahmin, you know, if your mother died, if, if your mother died, would that cause unhappiness, suffering in your life. You say, oh yes, that would, or if she changed, you know, some alteration or situation changed, her health deteriorated or whatever. And he said, yes, yes, of course, I'd feel suffering. And then the Buddha goes through all the relative, the possibilities of relatives, you know, father, son, daughter, aunt, all of them, you know. And then the Brahmin got the message, yes, of course, you know, if we are attached to a person and if something changes with them, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to even be that they die or get sick or um, whatever. It can be just that we've had a fight. We no longer regard them uh, as a friend, as a lover, or whatever. It can be many things. But the the Buddha was pointing out that you know this is where those things that we hold very dear and we are very attached to. This is the important thing. Actually, we're attached to. They will bring suffering actually. And so that uh, messenger, that Brahmin, went back to Queen Malika and explained it to her. And then she went to see the king and King Persenity and said, you know, if your daughter, Bajira, I think it is, were to become very sick or change or become or die, would that cause you suffering? Would that cause you unhappiness? And he said, of course it would. Of course it would. <laughs> and uh, then he goes through a number of other, you know, family members or uh, um, associates, friends of the, the king. And he says, yes, of course it is. And then she said, this is what the Buddha meant when he said those things and those, those people and those things that are dear to us bring suffering and unhappiness. Because they can, once we are attached to them, we will suffer if they change in any way, if they deteriorate, if they die. So that's a very, it was a quite a nice teaching, but it's very counterintuitive, isn't it? 
Because, I mean, how many of you, when you hear that, you know, the people that are dear and delightful to us and the things that are, they're going to bring stuff, you think, oh, no. <laughs> because, of course, they do bring happiness to us and there's, uh, there is that sense of connection that's very strong. And, uh, yes, there is happiness there. But in a very real sense, they're also because if we attach to those people, whether it be our partners, our children or whatever, it, it will cause us a lot of suffering when we are parted from them. And of course, this is what the Buddha is pointing to, isn't it? The noble truth where he says that being associated with what's unpleasant is suffering, is unsatisfactory. Being parted from what's dear and delightful, that's suffering, that's unsatisfactory. And this is uh, very true, and but sometimes a bit counterintuitive <laughs> for us. We, we like to think the other. And the same with uh, ill will is we, as I say, uh, non ill will, avia pada, as it is in uh, Pali. And this is a very, a very important uh, uh, emotion to deal with, isn't it? To, to develop non ill will, develop metta. And, but it has to come from a sense of, uh, of uh, wisdom too, uh, because if we, uh, if we come from a sense of wisdom, we know that it's not for our benefit, it's not for, our, uh, for the benefit of other people. And also, wisdom tells us, you, can, <laughs> you don't have to be Einstein to see this, if we have anger, ill will, hatred, irritation, what are the results of it? We can see the outward results very easily. People that were once friends are now enemies, um, and many, and, and and also can be dangerous consequences. People can come back and harm us. But also, it's very important with ill will that we don't repress it as well. We have to uh, know that it's there. Sometimes people uh, in the modern world with psychotherapy, the idea is to express. That's the first thing I was really <laughs> meaning to get to. So the idea of expressing, get it off your chest. But in actual fact, the Buddha is saying, get it off your chest is another way to actually reinforce it and for it to become stronger. The important, important point for us is to understand anger, what, whether it is benefiting us or not benefiting us. And this, but it is important that we understand that we don't just try and suppress it or repress it inside. We have to have an understanding that it is present, what it's like. Because if we do... Uh, put a um, stopper on it, uh, if we do try and cap it, it can burst out um, because we haven't really understood it. It's just really it's gone underground. It's a bit like those volcanoes, isn't it, like Bali at the moment. <laughs> it's going to burst out. It's going to erupt, you know, because we haven't understood it. We're just trying to keep keep it down, suppress it. And because of that, it can give rise to these, out, you know, outbursts of uh, anger and uh, uh, which is which is going to be can be very destructive and negative. And also, if it's internalized like that, it can lead to depression, because it's 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 uh, it's anger in a way when it comes directed towards ourselves tends to to turn into a depression to depression. So very important that uh, we can um, develop this metta, this uh, loving kindness. The important difference between metta and other forms of love, because we're, you know, everybody's familiar with uh, love, and it's a very big concept. You hear it in all the songs. <laughs> There's a lot of love songs. In fact, most of them are love songs or lack of, or songs about uh, not getting what they they want. Actually, that's often frustrated love. And same in Sri Lanka, I hear when I go on the buses, there's all these songs. They're all about adore, which is love, you know. <laughs> so it goes on and on. But this is love with a very strong, strong sense of self, a very strong sense of me and what I'm going to get, you know, wanting back from the other person to be loved. And we, we even see that... Uh, uh, in our family, in family love, in love for relatives and so on, we, we still want something back. There's still a sense of self. There's still a sense of conditions apply. <laughs> you have to behave like this or not like that, and then it's okay, then I love you. <laughs> but conditions apply. So there's always in these, uh, these, these sense, of, uh, sense of love, there are conditions that apply. I like this term. You see it in advertising a lot. Very small print. <laughs> At the bottom, it says, conditions apply. You can hardly read it. <laughs> can hardly read it. But metta or loving kindness is 
unconditional. So there are no conditions apply. It doesn't have to be that, the, you know, to, uh, we don't have to be perfectly lovable for ourselves to have a metta, loving kindness to ourselves. Other people don't have to be. They won't be anyway. <laughs> some, degree, some people are more lovable, you could say, than others, that's for sure. But, uh, but metta doesn't require that. That's very interesting. Recently I heard a very nice teaching that I really liked, which was if we, uh, if we are wanting love, if we're wanting to be loved, wanting to, to be appreciated, same, isn't it? Appreciated, have approval, we may not get it. But if we want to give love, who can stop us? Nobody can stop you giving love. And that means that the heart is full of love. You're developing that quality in the mind and in the heart. And instead of, you know, a very common idea is we can only develop love when the right person turns up, you know, which may or may not happen. It's, you know, it's a very unsure thing. So, in fact, metta, uh, maitri, or loving kindness is unconditional and we can give and we can, we can give it from ourselves regardless of the situation. We certainly have to give it to ourselves and once we have it, then possible to give to others. If we don't really have a loving kindness within ourselves, we don't really have that feeling of love within ourselves, acceptance within ourselves, warmth, friendliness, kindness to ourselves. How can we give it to another? It's almost impossible because we have to have that quality first. And in a very real way too, if we have in the situations where you know people have upset us by what they say or they've done, uh, then People say, oh, you know, we should develop uh, metta, we should develop loving kindness towards them. And I say, well, if you're an advanced practitioner, go ahead. <laughs> but of course, the first person we have to deal with, has to, we have to have metta for is ourselves, uh, loving kindness. And if we have that quality in our hearts, then we may be able to spread that to another person that has upset us. But first of all, we have to have it ourselves. Otherwise, we end up with cosmetic metta. It just sort of covering over with maybe be happy and well, but underneath you think, oh, you know, wishing the worst for them possible, you know. So, and this creates, you know, it's just cosmetic. It's not coming from the heart. So we have to work on that within ourselves. That's the most important thing. And to, to be able to give it to others. And of course, it's, it is the wisdom that the metta is supported by, as I said before, is the understanding that we, like everybody else, wants happiness, well-being, and we want peace. We want freedom from difficulties and problems. And when we, it's a very important thing, that if we, we realize that's our motivation, then when we know that, what we know what we find as uh, happiness, what we'd like, what we don't like, then we can think, other people perhaps won't like to hear what I'm going to say, <laughs> and therefore I won't say it and we can have loving kindness in that form. So it's very important that we, we realize that other people very much are the same nature as us. They want the same happiness, the same sense of peace, uh, the same sense of acceptance. And uh, the last one I want to very briefly deal with is uh, in intentions or motivations of non-cruelty, avihinksa, and that's very important. Uh, these days, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot in the uh, media, isn't there, in the news about, uh, we could say it's cruelty or we could say it's sexual abuse these days is the big one that's in, in the media a lot, the sexual abuse. But all these sorts of uh, different abuse, it can be verbal, it can be physical, uh, it can be emotional, or psycho psychological. Uh, all these things are what we're aiming to address when we develop the motivation of harmlessness, not wishing harm on another person, realizing that just as we, this is the wisdom that underpins it, just as we don't want to suffer, just as we don't want to be abused, whether it be physically, verbally, sexually, emotionally, psychologically, <laughs> just as we don't want that, other people don't want it either. And so that can support developing these uh, positive emotions. And of course we can develop, uh, compassion is a very important uh, uh, meditation subject to develop and we can do that by reflecting on somebody we know, it's better if it's someone we know who is experiencing some difficulty in their life, some suffering in their life and then use that to develop this feeling of well-wishing for them, wishing that they can be free from this difficulty. 
and then we can extend it to other people that we know who have difficulties in their lives and then eventually to all beings, you know, to all beings. Because we realize it, it underpins life that there will be in our lives at times when there is great unsatisfactoriness, there's great suffering and difficulties, whether it be physical or mental. So this is a very uh, helpful way to reflect that all beings have this, of the same nature as us. So this gives you an idea of the uh, three, as we say, the three uh, right motivations. And as I say, they're right because they lead to enlightenment. If you want to develop other qualities, <laughs> the negative, they'll be right for leading to a lot of trouble and problems if we develop uh, the, the negative side of it, which is a lot of sensual desire, a lot of anger, and a lot of cruelty. It will lead to a lot of suffering in our lives. So these right motivations are very useful, as I say, for um, experiencing happiness here and now. Because when we let go, very often if we really let go, there's a real sense of relief. We've put down a burden. And that's how you know that letting go has worked. And as I say, it's from wisdom. You can't force it. When you realize something's not worthwhile to desire, you can let go of it very easily. You know, you can let go of it, no problem. The mind just does it by itself. I'm not interested. <laughs> uh, so that's a very immediate uh, happiness you can get from that. And of course, developing loving kindness is a very pleasant emotion here and now. And it also, we can develop it more and more so that it informs the whole path. And developing non-cruelty towards ourselves and others is also something we can see the benefit of. And instead, ha helping and uh, not harming so these are very uh, useful motivations in day-to-day -day life, very practical ones too, um, for us. Some of them more difficult than others, especially at Christmas time. Letting go is not, not encouraged. <laughs> they want you to get more, <laughs> to buy more, and so on, so support the economy or whatever. So uh, this is, uh, this, but these are very useful things that lead to our happiness and well-being, the Buddha said, and will lead to awakening and to enlightenment. So I'd like to encourage all of us, myself included, to develop right motivation and allow it to uh, practice it with all the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path so it leads to happiness here and now, happiness in future lives and the happiness of awakening enlightenment. So thank you very much for, for listening to the talk. <laughs> so, there we are. hope it was useful. Is there one question, just maybe one question, if there are any questions or comments? Yes. Yes, Chitra, yes. Um, these, these things of kindness, gentleness, uh, harmlessness, uh, they are not very tangible, are they? I mean, it is brought about by cause and effect, cause and effect. So, hmm. Hmm. is this five aggregates really responsible for that? You have to have the conducive conditions for hmm. this to, to happen. Hmm. So, are we really in control of what is going to be happening? Good question. Are we really in control of what's going to be happening in terms of developing these uh, the positive qualities? Of course, uh, we aren't in control of it. That's 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 for sure. And um, you know, we are. We cannot, as it were, create those emotions per se. You know, we cannot create a feeling of loving kindness. We cannot uh, create compassion. What we can do is create the causes and conditions for those emotions to arise, and they will arise. You know, and if we practice in particular ways, very likely to arise. So we can't control, that is a very, very important point. But what we're working with, the whole path is aimed at, isn't it? Getting the causes right, getting the conditions right, and then the results will come by themselves. And this is the essence of the whole path. So in other words, you know, when we're developing letting go, getting the causes right, is understanding, you know, that these things that we may be attached to, uh, that we think are forms that are going to bring us happiness, not in fact that that they're not going to deliver the goods that they say they're going to. And that gives rise to the wisdom that lets go. Because in the end, what lets go? What is liberated? In the end of the path, what becomes awakened? The mind. 
becomes uh, liberated from the defilements. The mind becomes liberated from samsara. And it's the same it's with uh, renunciation, you know, developing, letting go. It's the mind that lets go because it just knows this is worthless. I mean, it, there are other perceptions that the mind can develop that aid that. Of course, anicca, you know, the sense of things being impermanent. I mentioned, you know, when we have all these desires for various things that we want to buy or get, or, you know, think will lead to a lot of happiness, new tab, a new this, a new that. But uh, if we see the fact that they are, they are in, uh, impermanent, impermanent's a good word, but temporary, that they don't last, then that can actually aid letting go in a big way. Because when, when we, when we uh, have the mind of getting, it's, it's sort of like, this is going to make me really happy. And we're not thinking of the fact that, oh yes, it breaks down. And uh, in time, it will be in, in the rubbish bin as well. <laughs> Everything is, including our bodies. So yes, very much we have to develop the wisdom with renunciation, the causes and conditions for loving kindness. Uh, of course, uh, is attention to the positive, attention to the positive within ourselves and others, the non-discriminating, the non-judgmental mind, uh, and the understanding, as I mentioned, that all beings, uh, we, myself included, want happiness. We want to avoid suffering, and we want acceptance, warmth, friendship, all these things. So that, that underpins, that's a cause and condition. And the same for harmlessness, you know, not uh, non-cruelty. The understanding that all beings um, don't wish to be harmed. I don't want to be harmed. And all beings don't wish to be harmed. And to develop the, uh, the meditations, the perceptions. I don't know if you noticed, I used the word perception. And the Buddha often uses perception as a stepping stone for developing wisdom. Because perception... Our perceptions, you know, like our ordinary perceptions, we see things as permanent. <laughs> we see things as uh, a lot of things as happiness, and we see a lot of things as self. But in actual fact, the Buddha said most of them are the opposite, completely the opposite. You know, they're not permanent. They're not really happiness. They may be temporary happiness, a very short-lived happiness, and they're not really self. They're just a process. So these sorts of understandings are crucial. For, for the mind, as it were, to develop letting go, to develop um, um, metta or maitri, and for to developing compassion. So thank you for that. It's true, we, don't, we can't control those things, but we can certainly influence the causes and conditions, have an input at that stage, and we've got great guidance from the Buddha that these things work, <laughs> and we can try them at home. <laughs> we should try them at home, in fact. We have to take them home for it to be, uh, you know, to really go deep. Yeah. So thank you for that that question. I hope, I, did I answer that question or? Up to a point, Bhante. Yeah, up to, it's always the way. Yes, yeah. I'll talk to you later. Thank All you. All right. Thank you for that question. That was good. All right. And so now we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. And those who wish are welcome to come over for a shared meal together. <laughs>